So when we look at the history books in 10, 15 years, you believe that Ukraine is a win for the West. I believe it will be seen as uh, Russia lost Ukraine, Putin lost Ukraine. Hi everyone, I'm Ian Bremer, and welcome to your G-Zero world. As you can tell, I am outside on a rooftop in downtown Manhattan. It is a gorgeous, if a little brisk, day, uh, but a great time to talk to former Swedish Prime Minister Carl Bildt. He was also foreign minister, invented Swedish fish, and many other things. Uh, we'll be talking about Russia, Ukraine, Europe, and heck, a little Trump. But first, your world this week. First, President Trump is right now on his way to Asia for a 12-day trip. It's by far the most important of his presidency to date. Critical is China. He's meeting with Xi Jinping on Xi's turf. This is right after President Xi gave his big speech saying he's prepared for China to become a global superpower. Wait, Trump thought he was the global superpower. A lot of international leaders, she included, believe that Trump is the weakest American leader we've had in modern history. But Xi Jinping is clearly the strongest. That's going to make for very interesting bilateral relations. We need to watch really the trade issue. Trump feels like the Chinese are taking advantage on trade and when they're no longer useful on North Korea, and they're not gonna deliver the North Koreans to the Americans clearly, then you're gonna start to see the beginnings of tit for tat trade escalation. Any talk that looks like we might be on the precipice of that, the timing is getting closer, is going to royal international markets. Those are the headlines we should be paying attention to. The other big issue is North Korea. This is the first time that President Trump comes into an international environment with a crisis. Not just the ability to embarrass or make a political misstep, but actually the potential for international confrontation. Will Kim Jong-un, little rocket man, as President Trump calls him, will he test a weapon, a nuclear weapon, as he is threatened to do? How about testing an ICBM that goes near President Trump's flight path while he's right on the doorstep? And how will Trump react? By far the most important thing that could be occurring on this trip. Let's hope it doesn't come to that. We'll watch next week. But back in the United States made the biggest headlines this week, that of course, the Mueller investigation bringing its first indictments against Paul Manafort and his deputy, Paul, the former chair of the Trump campaign. Nobody's surprised he's caught up in money laundering and conspiracy against the United States, which is really another way of saying money laundering. Um, but perhaps my favorite part of the story was George Papadopoulos, who I kind of like, I mean, 30 year old guy, he listed on his resume that he did model UN. I mean, who doesn't like that kind of thing? Um, also, so many George Papadopoulos is in Greece right now. Um, I mean, it's the last time that so many Greeks were falsely impugned was back when Wolfgang Schäuble was Minister of Finance in Germany. Okay, that's abstruse. Then of course, there's Tony Podesta caught up in all of this. He runs the Podesta firm and has resigned as a consequence of his connections to Paul Manafort. Tony Podesta, that's the brother of John Podesta, who was the campaign chief for Hillary Clinton. Two Podestas, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Yes, everyone is kind of dirty in all of this, and there is going to be more on the Dems, not just on the Republicans. But what we really know is when people start talking and cooperating with an investigation, the net is about to get an awful lot wider. And finally, to Saudi Arabia, some 4,000 people collecting at what they called Davos in the desert. And it's because this man, Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince, is promising radical reform. You've seen that women are now going to be allowed to drive as of next year. They're also calling directly for moderation of the rulings around Islam uh, in the kingdom. $500 billion to be spent on this corner of Saudi Arabia. Yeah, it's all desert right now. They're going to create a massive city, which they promise will be the next Dubai or Abu Dhabi. And then how about this? 
Sophia the robot. Given citizenship in Saudi Arabia, you'll notice she has no headscarf and she's unaccompanied by a male. Mike Pence won't be having dinner with her, certainly, but leave that aside. Women in Saudi Arabia don't have that kind of right right now. Are they gonna get it? If you talk to the crown prince, he'd probably say yes. The question's gonna be execution risk. How do they get all of this done in such a short period of time with a culture and with domestic opposition that is gonna find a lot of this quite a bit to stomach? We'll see, but certainly bears watching very closely. That's your world this week. And now, the big interview. I bring books. When I'm on uh, planes, I bring books. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm here with Carl Bildt. Uh, on his bio, uh, it says uh, he has been most things, but uh, Prime Minister uh, Bildt, uh, and of course from Sweden, he's also been Foreign Minister, and most recently, uh, he is now co-chair of the European Council on Foreign Relations. We are here with Carl having some coffee in my backyard, a very New York experience. I'm delighted to be with him. On a sunny morning in New York. Yeah. Absolutely. Great Absolutely. to be here. So let's look at Europe for a second. So when you're, you're seeing how, how you consider leadership in Europe today, especially on the back of these elections in Germany where Merkel did not perform that well, who's leading Europe, if anyone, today? How do you think about that going forward? Well, you have, at, at the moment, of course, you have two individuals, if you're going to identify Merkel individuals, and Macron. You have Merkel and Macron. Right. And, and, and Merkel, after all, yes, problematic. The election wasn't what she had hoped. But still, she's, in, she's the personality of Germany. She's the personality of Europe. She will get an interesting type government there. Macron is a more inspirational leader. He launches sort of 100 proposals every day on, on, on the future of, of Europe. And those two. Then we have sort of uh, somewhat problematic sort of feelings in the East, old Central Europe. They feel somewhat left behind by all of these talk in Brussels and refugees and things like that. that that's a challenge at the moment. And, I mean, and the Brits, of course, wherever they are at the moment. But is that leadership? I mean, is, is given the amount of, I mean, Macron can come up with hundreds of proposals, but yeah. ultimately just governing France is going to be really hard. For him. Germany, just governing Germany is not as hard, but putting a coalition together is yep. going to be much more yep. challenging. You've got Brexit negotiations. Yep. When you see all of this, do you, do you, is it possible for Europe to really do things as Europe going forward? If we go back immediately after the Brexit vote, which was a shock to everyone, yes. um, there was a lot of pessimism. So what's going to happen? Uh, is the, everything going to break apart? If you look at things now, oh, it's very different now. I mean, we have what I call the BTP factor, um, which is the Brexit, Trump, Putin factor, that has uh, which led you see as unifying Europe. With, all through. Well, I mean, you have uh, look at opinion polls. Support for the European Union is up 10, 15 percent in virtually every country, and that is not necessarily love of Brussels, but it's the BTP factor, add the M factor, Macron. Um, if you look at what the, there was a summit meeting, or the most recent summit meeting of the heads of state and government, uh, they adopted a work plan for what to do, which is quite ambitious. I mean, they're actually doing things in terms of uh, external border, asylum, digital signal market. It's all fairly sort of, it's a coalition building all the time. And uh, somewhat complicated by necessity, 27, 28 governments and inside those particular governments, but I, 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 there's a mood of optimism in Europe today, which uh, a year ago would have been unthinkable. And you think that um, of those three, Brexit, Trump and Putin, yeah. if you had to rank them, it would be that order? I think it would be in that order. Um, I think it would be. Uh, the, Brexit has, the Brexit process has uh, demonstrated how we are tied together, much more than we thought we were. I mean, there, there are endless numbers of problems. I, I wasn't aware, to take one sort of small example, I wasn't aware 
that we have passports for dogs and cats in Europe. And, and all of the bits to go with those are the dogs or the cats to the houses in the south of France. No problem whatsoever. Yeah, I don't need moose with a passport. No, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> but now this has to be renegotiated, of course. I mean, the Brits have to introduce a system of passports for their cat, cats and dogs. That's doable. We have to negotiate an arrangement with Britain and, 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 and the EU for the cats and the dogs. That's doable. But thousands of these things have to be done. Yeah which we were not aware of because it's part of daily life. And, and when people become aware of that, they say, well, stick together. The Putin factor, of course, historically has helped to divide a lot within Europe. There are a lot of people that benefit economically from the Russians. Yeah. There are those that don't. He's very close to many in Eastern Europe, yeah. the Hungarian model, certainly. So do you really see, again, you, you've been very close to a lot of these Russian negotiations, mm -hmm. Ukraine and the rest. Mm -hmm. Do you really see Putin as a unifying factor in Europe? I think, yes, it has, together with other factors, is it demonstrated that we have a neighborhood that is complicated. Uh, complicated for some and threatening for others. Uh, but it's not as benevolent as we had hoped it would be. But not attractive for some? I don't think Russia is particularly attractive. Um, you can't say that for Hungary, can you? Well, you can even say that for Hungary, but I mean, national identity is perhaps more important to them than could it be for Swedes or for the Irish or whatever. And that you see, and that sort of Mr. Orban and others are playing on the Kaczynskis in Poland. Um, I don't think it should be confused being, uh, saying pro-Russian. Um, you know, the, the, the fact that the Russians have been seen as playing a delegitimizing role in the U.S. election is on the news daily and very polarizing. Now, that's clearly happened in some of the European elections as well. Has that played much of a role in European consciousness about Russia? Not that much. Yeah. Uh, less so. And, and it's because they've not been very effective or because the Europeans don't think it matters? Or I think. Well, I, in my view, it's because of, we've seen it before. I mean, the, Americans are waking up to the realities of the modern world. Mm -hmm. Europe has been living in a confrontation with, remember, the Soviet Union. I mean, the Soviet Union used to pay a political party in my country, paid newspapers, had radio stations that were broadcasting in Swedish. Uh, and and th those particular newspapers and whatever they were paying, it was fake news from page one to page whatever it was. Sure. Um, so propaganda uh, from the East has been part of our political system for a long time. Now, yeah. it hasn't been the case in the US to the same extent at all. At all. Uh, then, of course, technology, social media transforms it somewhat. Uh, but I would argue it's not, we don't see it as, as new as you do. Now, I remember, you know, after the Ukraine intervention, you and I were sitting, I think it was in Munich, and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, there was this feeling of urgency, something has to be done. Mm -hmm. Now, it feels like a frozen conflict now. We don't talk about yeah. it as much. Um, how do you think um, this is a collective failure of the United States and Europe? Could anything have been done, or is this simply Russia gets to project power in its backyard, and that's that? I think when, when the history is written at some point in time, it will be the history of the Russians losing. Putin lost Ukraine. Um, Putin took Crimea, uh, tried to unravel all of the southern Ukraine, failed. And Ukraine has now, and, and he did this in order to stop also an agreement with the European Union. That agreement is in force. He didn't succeed in eastern Ukraine. Uh, he's uncomfortable with Eastern Ukraine. He doesn't speak about it any longer. I mean, he, he lost de facto. So when we look at the history books in 10, 15 years, you believe that Ukraine is a win for the West? I believe it will be seen as uh, Russia lost Ukraine. Putin lost Ukraine. Uh, remember, these are nations that have been close to each other for forever in every single respect. And uh, the net effect of grabbing Crimea, trying to unravel the south of Ukraine, failing with that, invading the country, is that Ukraine has turned far more to the West and far more away from Russia. That is a significant historical loss for Russia that Putin is responsible for. So let me ask you uh, finally about the United States. And you, you've been outspoken uh, in your views uh, of uh, President Trump a couple weeks ago, I talked to Jelani Cobb, uh, who said that he doesn't see Trump as a blip, but rather a harbinger 
uh, of what's to come, given the structural forces in society today. Um, in terms of the transatlantic relationship, which do you think it is? I think it is, uh, and that has to be the working assumption, I think it's a fairly significant blip. I, I, I think our societies across the Atlantic are so tightly bound together in economic terms, in security terms, in human terms, that sort of it's, uh, uh, it's bound to be a blip. But um, that being said, uh, even if Trump were to disappear tomorrow, which I don't think will happen, there will be traces of him and traces of him, his ideas uh, for quite some time to come. Carl Bildt, always a voice of reason, and great to see you. Thanks so much. Thanks for the coffee.